Hello and welcome back. Today we will be delving into a paper written in 1964 by a professor on Canute and his empire. The professor was G. N. Garmon's Way and it was published in 1963 and also 1964. Knut and his empire. On first consideration, I thought it would be appropriate to describe the five outstanding attacks on London by the Vikings during this period. The theme which so fired the imagination of Miss Dorothea Koch when she was shown the burial mounds of Norwegian, Norwegians and told that they were the graves of the destroyers of London Bridge. However, not only because the story has already been so geographically described by Miss Koch herself in her travel sketches, but also because much of the evidence dealing with these attacks, confusing as it is, has already been set forth by ably discussed others. I have chosen instead to speak of Canute, a Danish king, whose two attempts to storm the city of London met with no success, but who yet succeeded by his prowess and strength of character in establishing a wide empire across the western seas. Henry of Huntington praises him for his nobility and greatness of mind, and one of the earliest Danish historians, Sven Agesson, proudly boasts of the multiplicity of his virtues, which enabled him to extend the boundaries of his imperium from Ultima Thule almost to Greece, subduing, he claims, Hibernium, Anglium, Gallium, Langobardium, Teotonium, Nuragium, Slauium, Cumsamia in the process. However, Canute's greatest greatness is most evident not in any inflated beadroll of his conquests, but in his achievement in restoring confidence to an England harassed for more than 200 years by Viking attacks, and for his success in persuading Englishmen and Scandinavians to accept his rule and to work together as fellow subjects for the common weal. He achieved this acceptance of his overlordship, as Edmund Burke said of Henry of Navarre, by never seeking to be loved without putting himself first in a condition to be feared, and used soft language with determined conduct. An early history of the Abbey of Croyland testifies that he treated the English in particular in the most courteous and friendly fashion, and instantly showed his affection for Holy Church. He developed the writ as an effective instrument as Dr. Harmer has shown, and improved the economic life of the country by trade legislation which increased the responsibilities of the boroughs and secured uniformity in their legal procedure. As recent research has pointed out, he regulated the currency so that towards the end of his reign he was able to keep an appreciably greater number of coins on a standard of weight. He was remembered for the grandeur and magnificence of his court, and his reputation as a humane and politic prince lasted in the land long after the Norman conquest, so that Henry Knighton in the 14th century could claim that no predecessor on the English throne save King Arthur equaled him in greatness. The first mention of Canute in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is in the entry for ten 13, where it is recorded that as his father Swain, after taking hostages from the conquered territories of Northumbria, Lindsay, and the five borough towns, committed his ships and hostages into the charge of Canute, his son, before setting forth to march south to bring about the submission of London and the expulsion of King Ethelred and his queen from the realm. The following year, in a laconic entry, the Chronicles record Swain's death at Candlemas and tells us that all the fleet chose Canute as king. In Snorri's separate Olaf saga Helga, 
there is a reference to the English legend of the manner of Swain's death, and it is told by the Englishman that Edmund the Holy killed him in the same fashion as St. Mercurius killed Julian the Apostate, and the legend preserved by Simeon of Dermon and others tells how in the midst of his court at Gainsborough, Svein alone saw St. Edmund armed coming against him, and was afraid, and began to shout great cries, saying, Help me, my comrades, behold, St. Edmund has come to slay me. And saying this, sharply pierced by the holy blade, he fell from the horse on which he was sitting, and tormented with great agony, until the fall of night ended his life on the 3rd of February, February by a wretched death, and was buried at York. The saga makes Knut only ten years old at the time, and says it was decided that he should not claim his kingdom in England for three years, but it is hardly likely that Svein would have put his fleet under the command of a boy of nine the previous year. And it is more probable that Knut was in his teens when his father died. It is some evidence of the young man's ability to promise that he was chosen by free election to succeed the commander of a fleet of ruthless battle-seasoned veterans, many of whom had been schooled in the rigors, rigorous discipline of a military garrison, such as that reputed to have existed at Jomsburg in the Baltic. Although the actual existence of Jomsburg has been questioned, it is no doubt true that the success of the Danish invasions was largely due to the presence of, in the Viking fleets of large forces of such professional soldiers, maintained on a permanent war footing, who formed the backbone of the hosts that had become the scourge of the western seas. Possessed as they were by fervent loyalty to their chief, these comrade-in-arms, known as house carls, formed a formidable comitatus who would have lightly tolerated the accession of a young leader if weak and lacking in promise. The young prince had presumably learned well the lesson which is driven home in the first section of the Beowulf poem to bring it about while he is in his father's care by good and ready gifts of treasure that willing comrades will stand by him in after times and support their chief when war comes. Generosity, continues the poet, is the condition of success in every community. Indeed, Canute's father had set him a good example in this respect. For Emma's biographer tells how Svein had rendered his men submissive and faithful to him by manifold and generous munificence. Perhaps historians have been too censorious in blaming Canute in his later life for restoring to an excessive use of graft as a hidden persuader to lure even his enemies to desert, desert their lords and take service under his banner. Whatever we think of his use of bribery, it is evident that his experience was similar to that of the Havamal poet who never found a man so generous and hospitable that he would not receive a present, nor one so liberal with his money that he would dislike a reward if he could get one. In the Viking Age, young princes accepted responsibility early. If we can trust the testimony of the Heimskrigla, Eric Bloodax took command of a fleet at the age of twelve, and St. Olaf was given a Viking ship about the same age. Earl Erl Eric, son of Hakon, was apparently in charge of a ship at the age of ten or eleven, while St. Olaf was often on Viking expeditions whilst under the care of his foster father. Knut's early martial training had been received from Thorkel the Tall, to whom Svein had sent him for fosterage, and he had undoubtedly accompanied his foster father on raids. Thorkel was the brother of Earl Sigvaldi, the commander of the reputed Jomsborg fortress, and famous as the leader of a disastrous raid on Norway. When attempting to fulfill some extravagant boasts, which he, Thorkel, and Svein had made over their cups at a funeral feast, 
Thorkell led an invasion force against England in 1009, possibly to avenge his brother's death. And although he has been blamed, particularly by William of Malmesbury, for the murder of Archbishop Ailhief, it is very probable that the version of the incident recorded by Thaitmar of Meersburg, being an almost contemporary record of the event, comes nearer the truth in exonerating Thorkell from any complicity in the deed. No doubt the drunken Vikings, incensed by the archbishop's refusal to pay a ransom, got completely out of hand, and Thorkell, says Thaitmar, seeing from a distance that the archbishop was surrounded by a troop with weapons to kill, ran up quickly and cried, Do not, I beg you, do this. I will give to all of you, with a willing heart, gold and silver, all that I have here or can get somehow, except only my ship, on condition that you do not sin against the Lord's anointed. Yet he was powerless to soften the unbridled anger of his men, or prevent the barbarous slaughter of the archbishop. Revolted by the experience, he changed sides the following year, joined Ethelred, and gave up his heathen faith to become a Christian. Under the tutelage of this experienced soldier in the tough school of Jomsburg, it is not surprising to find the young Canute graduating at an early age to a position of authority, capable of shouldering some of his father's responsibilities. A panegyric by Otter the Black, spoke in praise of Canute, emphasizes his youthful enterprise and ferocious temperament. Destroyer of the chariot of the sea, you were of no great age when you pushed off your ships. Never younger than you did Prince set out to take his part in war. Chief, you made ready your armored ships and were daring beyond measure. In your range, Canute, you mustered the red shields at sea. Young leader, you made the English fall close by the Tees. The deep dike flowed over their bodies of Northumbrians. You broke the raven sleep, waker of battle. Bold son of Svein, you led an attack at Sherston, farther to the south. The economum inume may have invented the story of Svein, seeking his son's counsel before deciding to accept the exhortations of his soldiery to lead an attack against England. But however that may be, the biographer's intention was clearly to convey an impression of Canute's youthful sagacity. All historians from Freeman to Stanton have praised Svein's generalship, and his remarkable career marks him as an opportunist quick to take advantage of a situation, unlikely to seek directions from others. The biographer, however, does not neglect to notice that while Canute says he approves of the undertaking, his decision is prompted by the fear of being accused of wily sloth if he opposes the proposal, thereby perhaps giving a hint not only of Canute's capacity for summoning up a situation, but also of his craftiness and of the delight in cunning equivocations which in later life he used most effectively to ensnare traitors. Edric, who was responsible for many of the English military disasters of Ethelred's time, fell into one of these verbal traps and convicted himself out of his own mouth when he came to claim his reward from Canute for the murder of King Edmund. Hail! Complete king who yesterday wert only half a king, may you reward the author of your wholeness, whose hand has removed and plucked from the earth your sole enemy. Then the king, although very sorrowful, answered with unchanged expression, Good God, tell me who has been so conspicuous a friend to me, so that I may set him above all his comrades. The slave answered, Myself. And then the king ordered him to be swung up on the high and hanged on the tallest oak, a fit and proper end for slaves. 
we should perhaps be diff diffident in giving too much credence to the originality of this kind of verbal exchange, particularly when in Walter Mapp and in A Life of Harold, we find Canute is credited with the use of a stratagem identical with that used by King Claudius when he attempted to send Hamlet to his death in England. The letter of death, motif, is as early as the Iliad, where Belafran carries with him baleful tokens, which spell out orders for his destruction. Walter Mapp writes, writes, Knut began to fear the spirit of the young Englishman Godwin, who was possessed both of physical strength and cunning. Although by necessity he made use of him, nevertheless, conceiving in his own mind something of the spirit of Saul, he thought out a device to destroy his most active deliverer and champion whom it was not easy to suppress openly except by secret malice. Fortunately for himself, Godwin, suspecting Canute's motives, breaks the seals of the letters on board his ship bound for Denmark, and by the skillful hand of a scribe, rewrites them to the intent that he is to be received with the greatest ceremony by all, and to be given the king's sister in marriage if we should treat these stories with caution, particularly since post-conquest writers with Norman sympathies are apt to bestow upon all pre-conquest kings, whether English or Dane, more than an average endowment of guile and craftiness, it is more difficult to justify Canute's actions after the death of Svein at Gainsborough. He hastily withdrew his forces from England to return to Denmark, throwing away all the advantages he had inherited from the campaign of his father, the support of the Northumbrians, many of them Scandinavian by birth, and the aid of the people of Lindsay, who had promised him military supplies and horses. Perhaps the sudden access of responsibility which was too much for him. The Ecomium Ime however, is quick to justify his retreat on the grounds that faithful friends had found a plan to preserve his honor and ordered a fleet to be got ready for him, not because he was fleeing afraid of the harsh outcome of war, but in order to consult his brother Harold about so weighty a matter. It must also be remembered that the English had just received a fresh surge of confidence at Swain's death, and had sent to France for their king, Ethelred, who had returned to declare every Danish king outlawed from England. Here was the opportunity of putting an end to the fear of the establishment of yet another Scandinavian kingdom in Northumbria, which had long beset the minds of English kings. Moreover, if Olaf Haraldson, later known as St. Olaf, did accompany Ethelred from Normandy, as is thought, Knut may have considered his chances of successful resistance against such an alliance to be exceedingly slim. The chronicle states that he stayed in Gainsborough until Easter, but thereupon sailed from the Trent for Sandwich as Ethelred's punitive expedition to the north reached Lindsay. At Sandwich, he put ashore the hostages which Svein had entrusted to him, and setting all divine and human laws at defiance. As William of Malmesbury deplores, he despoiled his hostages, men of great nobility and elegance, of their ears and noses. Some he even castrated, and so tyrannizing over the innocent and boasting of the feet, he returned to his own country. Margaret Ashdown writes, Canute's brutal treatment of his hostages may well have seemed justifiable to himself, and Ethelred's unexpected appearance may well have caused confusion among the Danes. While the chronicle takes the point of view that Canute had betrayed his supporters in Lindsay by retiring to his ships, it is possible that Canute himself considered that the people of Lindsay had dealt treachery, treacherously with him. 
no other barbarous action of the kind has been imputed to him and one may suspect that the young king lost his head in an emergency while canute's conduct cannot be excused under any circumstances it may also be remembered that his contemporary olaf was guilty of perpetrating the most hideous and premeditated atrocities in his missionary crusades throughout norway and that in, in such inhuman conduct did not stand in the way of his subsequent canonization whether Canute's withdrawal from England should be regarded as ignominious retreat or as evidence of his caution and good sense, his return to Denmark proved awkward and embarrassing for his brother Harold, who was then ruling as King of Denmark. The Economium Ime describes the conversation of the brothers thus. I have come, said Canute partly out of my love for you, and partly to avoid the unforeseen audacity of barbarous fury. But there is one thing which you will first do for me, if you begrudge me not the glory which is mine, that is to divide with me the kingdom of the Danes, my heritage, which you hold alone, and afterwards we will add the kingdom of the English to our heritage, if we can do so by our joint efforts." King Harold, having heard these unwelcome remarks, answered his brother in these words, I rejoice, brother, at your arrival, and I thank you for visiting me, but what you say about the division of the kingdom is a scrious thing to hear. It is my part to rule the heritage which our father gave me with your approval. As for you, if you have lost a greater one, I regret it but though prepared to help you, will not endure that my kingdom be divided. When Canute had heard this, and had silently weighed his brother's reasonable words, he said, Let us be silent concerning this for the moment, for God alone may perchance arrange the matter more equitably. Communing in such words, and in other discussions of various kinds, and feasting at kingly banquets, they remained together for some time, and while mending the ships they re-established the army. In this Canute received the advice and help of his sister's husband, Earl Eric of Halthir, who had played the chief part in the overthrow of Olaf Tryggvason and who had ruled the western coast of Norway as viceroy of King Svein, Canute's father. Saxo Grammaticus also preserves a tradition that Olaf Haraldsson, later Saint Olaf, helped Canute to conquer England, and whilst this is not improbable, it is far from likely that Harald Halradi went on the expedition with Olaf, as Saxo makes out. In 1015, the combined fleets of the Norwegian and the Danes sailed from Denmark and came to Sandwich, and there turned at once round Kent into Wessex until they made the mouth of the From, to Harry in Dorset, Wiltshire and Somerset. The encomiast gives a vivid description of the ships, not, however, with the same wealth of technical detail he had previously employed to describe Spain's vessels, but conveying, perhaps, more effectively the impression the magnificent of the fleet would be likely to make on the eye of a beholder. So great, also, was the ornamentation of the ships that the eyes of the beholders were dazzled and to those looking from afar they seemed of flame rather than of wood. For if at any time the sun cast the splendor of its rays among them, the flashing of arms shone in one place, in another the flame of suspended shields. Gold shone on the prows, silver also flashed on the variously shaped ships. So great, in fact, was the magnificence of the fleet, that if its lord had desired to conquer any people, the ships alone would have terrified the enemy. Before the warriors whom they carried, 
joined battle at all. For who could look upon the lions of the foe, terrible with the brightness of gold, who upon the men of metal, menacing with golden face, who upon the dragons burning with pure gold, who upon the bulls on the ships, threatening death, their horns shining with gold, without feeling any fear for the king of such a force. King Ethelred retired sick to Cosham, near Portsmouth, while Prince Edmund gathered levies, but Elderman Edric left him in the lurch and deserted to Canute with forty ships. In the following year the Danes left their ships anchored in Pool Harbor, and the crews went up country to Harry in Wessex, and as far north as Warwickshire. Although every Englishman fit for military service was called up to report for duty, it all came to nothing. The chronicle says, as so often before, Prince Edmund and Uhtred of Northumbria raised levies in the north, but they did not join battle with Canute, who marched up to York unopposed. Uhtred surrendered, but was murdered soon afterwards, and Canute, now more master of Northumbria, Northumbria, put his Earl Eric over the territory. Edmund hurried to London to prepare for a Danish attack, while Canute marched to Pool Harbor, taking a southwestern route to his ships, and then sailed immediately for London. Before he could reach it, however, Ethelred died. The Londoners chose Edmund for their king, and five or six times during that summer he rallied the English, succeeding beyond expectation in harassing Canute, who made two unsuccessful attempts to take the city. Edmund's forces weakened by the treachery of Edric and Elfmere, were unexpectedly defeated at Ashingdon in Essex, where Edric and his men were first to set the example of flight, thus betraying his royal lord and the whole nation, as the chronicle comments. Thereafter, in the same year, on the advice of Edric and the councillors, Edmund and Canute met at Alney, near Deerhurst and Gloucestershire, to make a compact of mutual friendship, both with pledge and oaths, and fixed the amount of money to be paid to the Danish host. Post-conquest writers, however, in their accounts of the meeting, do not represent it solely as an occasion for parley, but preserve a tra tradition of single combat between the rival leaders of the hosts. The words of the Saxon chronicle, Hai Tugred Komen, are usually employed to describe the meeting of individuals or friends, although it is possible for them to be used of a hostile encounter. John Early therefore made the suggestion that the whole dramatic story of the single combat between Canute and Edmund arose simply from a misunderstanding of the phrase. But the economum ime, which is almost contemporary, preserves tradition that Edmund offered single combat to Canute, not on this occasion, however, but before the Battle of Ashingdon, and that it was refused. Henry of Huntingdon and Walter Mapp, on the other hand, represent the meeting as a duel and give convincing detail. The former, however, in Freeman's words, seems not to be clear whether he ought to be described a French tournament or a Scandinavian home gang. In his account, there is no mention of horses but we hear of spears and lances being broken, and it was not until then that swords were drawn. Walter Mapp, writing his De Nugis Curalium, late in the 12th century, presents a still fuller account of the encounter, no doubt, as C.E. Wright supposes, based on some local legend of the Gloucestershire with which he was connected by ecclesiastical ties. He describes how Canute was persuaded by the Danes to propose a duel to Edmund, to which the prince agreed. 
the needful arrangements were made with due solemnity. Truce was granted, keepers of the ground were armed, and the two combatants borne in two boats from opposite banks met on an island in the Sverne, <clears throat> each equipped with excellent and precious arms. Walter continues, Upon their several failures and successes after the fight was begun, we cannot dwell since we have to pass on to other subjects, but it gave rise to one memorable phrase. When their horses were slain, they fought on foot, and Knut, who was slender, thin, and tall, pressed his attack on Edmund, who was heavily built and stocky. With such blows, good and bad, that then a pause allowed for rest, while Edmund stood panting heavily, drawing deep breaths, Knut, in the hearing of the ring of men, said, Edmund, you are too short-winded. He, reddening for shame, kept silent, but at the next assault came down on his advisory's helmet with such a mighty blow that Knut fell on his hands and knees. Edmund, springing back, did not crush his fallen foe nor obstruct him when he was down, but in revenge gave back retort for retort, and said, Not too short-winded if I can bring so great a king to his knees. The Danes, therefore, seeing that Edmund had spared their lord in a combat of such great purpose, with many tears and prayers, urged them to become sworn brothers. Besides the kiss of peace, an exchange of clothes and arms is made despite the disparity in stature of the two men. In Gaimar's historical poem, where this incident is recounted, arrangements are made for the duel to take place on a ship moored by chains in the middle of the sphere. The spectators line the banks, but the two kings, after long prayers, looked at each other for a long time, until Canute proposed they should come to terms without fighting. It is clear from these accounts that the tra tradition of the home gang is at work. It was customary to fight such duels on an island so that they could be carried to a conclusion without interruption. Sometimes a field was marked out with poles of hazelwood. In Gaimar's narration, a ship makes an admirable substitute. In Anglo-Saxon law, there is no hint of the later judicial trial by combat. But the custom of the Scandinavian home gang must have been very familiar and it may well be that post-conquest writers have preserved a version of the story soundly based on local tradition. The end of the truce came sooner than was expected, for the English king died on St. Andrew's Day, 30 November 1016. The sole entry in the Parker Chronicle for 1017 records briefly in this year Canute was chosen king. He forthwith made an arbitrary division of his realm to reward his chief lieutenants, giving Mercia to the English traitor Ederic, Northumbria to Earl Eric, East Anglia to Thorkel, keeping Wessex for himself. The chronicle is silent about the feelings of the English now completely subject to the Viking invader, but thirty years of incompetence under Ethelred, Ethelred followed by the tragic disappointment of those high hopes inspired by Edmund's military success, had reconciled a demoralized people to accept the domination of a foreign prince. Mortified by open treacheries of Edric and disgusted with the secret plottings of Ethelric of Bocking, the men of Wessex were ready to accept the overlordship of any resolute ruler worthy of the name. Before Ethelred's death, death Wolfstan, Archbishop of York, in his sermon to the English, had preached against the deterioration in the standards of public life since the time of Edgar. The times were out of joint when men were ashamed of good deeds than of misdeeds, and there was little loyalty in the land. We are sopped too full of horrors nowadays for stories of Viking atrocities and plundering to move us much. Yet Pseudo Ingulf 
History of Abbey of Croyland, written from the viewpoint of a single monastic house, can still make its impacts on our imagination, quietly and without turgidity. It has the power to bring home to us the horror of the surprise attack, the miseries of the people, and the sta steady drain on the monastery's finances from successive levies for Danegeld. Monks and laymen fled to the security of the monastery in the flooded fens, so that the choir and cloisters were filled with monks, and the rest of the church with priests and clerks, the whole abbey with laymen. Even the cemetery was occupied night and day with women and children sleeping out under tents. It is therefore some indication of the attitude of Englishmen to Canute's advent to power when Ingulf could welcome the second year of Canute's reign as an occasion when the storms of battle had ceased and the serenity of peace had begun to shed prosperity upon times. I will stop there for this evening and next time we will continue with page 16 of our reading about Canute and his empire. Thank you so much for joining me. Please join me again next time.